We're all familiar with the terrible tragedy that occurred when the psychopath shot and murdered six people at a Christian school in Nashville, Tennessee this week. I would not address this except the fact that the anti-gun movement, which is their modus operandi, has decided to try to take advantage of again another terrible tragedy to push their political agenda of taking away guns from law-abiding Americans. And thus I feel it's my duty to step up and respond with some information that you need to know, specifically the lessons that we learned from the Parkland School shooting that were determined from a major 450 page report from a huge commission conducted by the state of Florida about how to protect our schools, which included, by the way, expanding teachers and administrators and programs associated with it, allowing them to carry guns in their schools. Let's talk about it when we get back. Hey folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of The Four Box of Dinah, proud American gun owner, constitutional attorney, member of the U.S. Supreme Court Bar, and New York Times bestselling author. If you haven't subscribed to The Four Box of Dinah's Second Amendment channel, please do so and show your love for the right to keep and bear arms. All right, folks. The anti-gunners are immediately trying to take advantage and push their gun control agenda to take our guns away, even though the people that watch this channel have done nothing wrong about anything. They're trying to use the terrible shooting by a woman, a transgender woman, in Nashville, Tennessee, of six Christians in a Christian school trying to push their anti-gun agenda. So I'm going to address this because I feel there's an important duty on my part to talk about history and the lessons of the past when we address these things. Because this is what's in the dialogue now. This is what's being discussed in the papers and in the news. So we have to talk about it, whether we like it or not. To begin with, this is not the first time that a school has been targeted by a psychopath for violence. We know that in 2018 at Parkland High School, Parkland, Florida, a mass shooter by the name of Nicholas Cruz went in and murdered many of his classmates. The state of Florida after this commissioned a report, and most of you don't know this, and this is the news. Most of you do not know because it was buried by the press. It got a lot of press initially, and then it disappeared. In 2018, after the shooting, Governor Rick Scott of Florida signed into law a commission established by the Florida legislature that had created a 15-person commission, including sheriffs, mental health professionals, state attorneys, victims' parents, and so on. These stakeholders were asked specifically to figure out what happened at the Parkland School shooting and what steps can be taken to prevent these from occurring. This commission lasted for about a year and it released a 446 page report, which I will put a link to down below. Now this report got a lot of press for about 24 hours and then it disappeared. The question is, why would a 450 page report specifically breaking out in extreme detail the government failures in Parkland and recommendations about how to stop it? Why would this get so little press once it was released? Well, it became pretty obvious once you read the report. The report said essentially that the big problem as to why these murders took place was frankly government incompetence by the law enforcement on site number one. And one of the solutions was that teachers and administrators that work at schools should have the opportunity to be trained and armed so they could protect themselves and the classes they teach and other people in the school. In other words, the commission that lasted a year, 445 page report, concluded that armed teachers and armed administrators were mission critical to protecting students from these kinds of mass attacks. This commission, by the way, was led by a chairman who was the Pinellas County Sheriff Bob Gotieri. Now, I mention Sheriff Gotieri because he is very important here. He started out when he opened up the commission and sat on it being against the idea 
of teaching of teachers or administrators having arms. He disagreed with that. He did not think that was the right plan. But after studying this with his peers, watching surveillance tape and studying the timelines of Parkland and other school shootings, Chairman Galtieri of the commission actually concluded that indeed you need to arm your teachers and administrators to protect the school. Bear in mind that the school resource officer, the school resource deputy, stayed outside the building while Nicholas Cruz sprayed bullets from his rifle. And I should notice that there should note that there was apparently another school resource officer in a nearby middle school who was not at school that day because he was off-site in training. So with all of this, that is what the commission concluded, that you need guns in schools to protect the students from bad people doing bad things. Now, this was not their only recommendation. Essentially, if you read their report, and I encourage you to do it, it's very interesting. They really, of course, adopt a defense in depth or multiple moats strategy, where there's a series of things that should be undertaken to protect the school from an attack. One of which, again, is armed teachers and armed administrators, because as we've talked about, no matter how fast police get there, keep in mind they got to the Sandy Hook school shooting in Connecticut in about three minutes, and still dozens of people were murdered. When seconds count, police are minutes away. It's not, not a criticism of police. It's just a harsh reality. And I should note that although the commission concluded that the school resource officer on duty at Parkland was derelict in his duty, that's in the report, we have to admit, and I completely agree, that the police officers in Nashville who responded, took charge, and took down the psychopath in the Nashville school shooting, they're heroes and they did a great job. But the reality is they took... 14 minutes between the time the call came in and the time they were able to take down the shooter. 14 minutes is an awful long time, and it's not the police officer's fault. It's just kind of the harsh reality of getting to places and getting into places. So even though I think that, yes, the Nashville police that responded and did their job are heroes, you got to keep in mind, and I think that the Parkland Commission recognized this, in many instances, you're not going to get the Nashville, Tennessee heroic cops you're just as likely to get the 400 Uvalde police officers that stayed outside, not confronting the shooter for over an hour, I believe. Or you might get the school resource officer at Parkland, who the commission concluded was derelict in his duty. So you just don't know who's going to respond to your call when you need them or when the school needs them. You just don't know if you're going to get the heroic, competent police officer or something less than that. And that is, I think, something that the commission at Parkland concluded and why, again, the people that have the most skin in the game to protect themselves and their students are the people that are already in the building when the bad guy, or in this case in Nashville, the bad girl, shows up. And the last point I want to make, of course, about police, and this is not about attacking police, it's just an observation. We've talked about this on this channel before many times, that under the law, police have no legal duty to protect you from criminals. So again, while we may get a heroic cop, there's just as good a chance that you'll get a police officer that's not interested. And anyway, they have no legal duty to protect you. The slogan to serve and protect is a marketing tool and is not reality in many instances. So let's dig in just briefly into this Parkland report. And I'm going to give you quotes directly from the report just to tell you how powerful it was that this report concluded after 450 pages of analysis and assessments that armed teachers and administrators are mission critical to protect schools. Quote, this is from the Parkland report that you need to know about, but the anti-gunners don't want you to know about it and they tried to bury it. That's why we're talking about it today. Quote, school districts and charter schools should permit the most expansive use of the Guardian program. The Guardian program, by the way, is the arming administrators and teachers. School districts and charter schools should permit the most expansive use of the Guardian program under existing law to allow personnel who volunteer are properly selected, thoroughly screened, and extensively trained to carry concealed firearms on campuses for self-protection and the protection of other staff and students. 
School districts and charter schools should not restrict the existing guardian program only to dedicated guardians. And all districts should expand the guardian eligibility to other school employees now permitted to be guardians. Further, the Florida legislature should expand the guardian program to allow teachers who volunteer, in addition to those now authorized, who are properly selected, thoroughly screened, and extensively trained to carry concealed firearms on campuses for self-protection self and the protection of other staff and students in response to an active assailant incident. That's very powerful language from the report itself. And I just want to say also that the chairman of the commission, the Pinellas County Sheriff, Bob Gautieri, said the following about the importance of armed teachers and administrators protect, to protect schools. He says, quote, the additional firepower from teachers trained to carry weapons would provide more coverage and create a deterrent that would make potential attackers think twice. I think it's a very, very powerful statement from the sheriff of Pinellas County. Now, here on the Four Boxes Diner, we also like to put certain things into historical context because I think part of my role here is to educate you beyond what may be in the newspaper and to try to provide you with some scholarship and some historical information. And I just want to talk a little bit about our founding because, as you know, the Supreme Court has said the right to keep and bear arms is based in part upon the understanding of Americans at the time the Second Amendment was adopted in 1791 their lived experiences, how they viewed firearms, which, of course, they viewed quite favorably as important to saving innocent lives against evil threats in all forms. Now, I bring this up because at the time of the founding, the founding fathers understood that if there was a danger to civilians, if there was a danger to Americans, the right answer is more guns, not less. We know that for multiple reasons. One obvious one is the fact that they actually put into the Bill of Rights the Second Amendment's right to keep and bear arms. Because if it was not that important to the Founding Fathers, why would they actually write it into the Constitution and adopt it in 1791, along with the rest of those fundamental rights we see in the Bill of Rights? So again, they wanted the citizens to be armed to stop evil in all of its form, including but not limited to tyrannical governments, of course, and invaders. But beyond that, we know that when the Founding Fathers were concerned about a particular place and whether or not that place may be extra vulnerable, their answer was more guns and more armed citizens and not less. I'm just going to give you one example here, and that is the state of Georgia's law that was adopted in 1770 involving churches. This is the law that says that people are to bring guns to church to protect the church from attacks. This is what the law says, Georgia, during our founding of the United States. Quote, every male white inhabitant of this province who is or shall be liable to bear arms in the militia and resorting to any church shall carry with him a gun or a pair of pistols. Period. Close quote. Again, the founding fathers were concerned about a location, as illustrated by that Georgia law. They actually encouraged firearms or even mandated them in some instances. I just want to close with, of course, two examples of how our founding fathers, before they adopted the Second Amendment's right to keep and bear arms, were well aware of mass killings and mass shootings. As we've talked about before, 1770, you had a mass shooting by the British of 11 Americans killing five. This was in 1770, 20 years before the adoption of the Second Amendment. Again, Founding fathers were aware of mass killings and mass shootings, including but not limited to the Boston Massacre of 1770. 11 Americans shot, five killed in a mass shooting. And lastly, I want to bring to your attention how the founding fathers were aware of massacres in schoolhouses before they adopted the Second Amendment. In July 26th of 1764, outside of what is today Greencastle, Pennsylvania, Enoch Brown, the schoolmaster, and 11 students came together to study in a schoolhouse. Three Indians broke in and massacred them all. In fact, a famous quote by a historian, Francis Parkman, said that this massacre of the 11 school children and Enoch Brown 
1764 was, quote, an outrage unmatched in fiendish atrocity through the annals of war, period, close quote. The famous historian Francis Parkman said that's how terrible this massacre of school children and their schoolmaster was in 1764. So again, the founding fathers were, were mass shootings and attacks on school children before they adopted the Second Amendment. So when they looked at all of this, they didn't conclude that the right answer was to put no gun signs on churches, no gun signs allowed on schoolhouses or anything like that. No, instead, the Second Amendment was adopted by the founding fathers. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Again, as the Supreme Court has said repeatedly, um, for various reasons, including but not limited to the importance of self-defense by Americans against all forms of tyranny, whether that tyranny constitutes a violent psychopath in a Christian school in Nashville, a violent psycho on the street somewhere, whether it be a foreign invader or whether it be a tyrannical government, it doesn't matter. The right to keep and bear arms for American citizens is there as a check and the ability to protect ourselves against tyranny in all of its forms. That's not how I view it. That's how the founding fathers view it. And I completely agree with our founding fathers. Okay, folks, I hope you learned a little bit something here today about the Parkland Report. Uh, you should check out the link to it down below. Very important about the conclusion after a major study that the answer is more armed teachers and administrators and not fewer. And also the fact that our founding fathers were aware of these kinds of instances occurring before they adopted the Second Amendment. And again, their solution was not to hang no guns allowed signs on places, but was instead to encourage Americans to come armed in self-reliance and be able to engage in self-defense of themselves, their families, their communities, and yes, indeed, ultimately, their country. Okay, if you haven't subscribed to the Four Boxes Diner channel, please do so, and we'll see you again here at the Four Boxes Diner. Order's up, table 2A.